Hello and welcome to another. Clap. Oh yeah, let's clap. Three, two, one. Keep that in. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to a free episode of the podcast Statistically Significant, which is about statistics, politics, and politics in statistics as well. My name is Tess. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm at a hearing about the Reserve Bank of Australia's interest rate hikes, getting ready to spit some truths and do a mic drop in front of the audience. Bard is here as well, taking notes from Marxist magazine. How's it going, Bard? Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and please don't accuse me of writing for a Marxist magazine. That sounds like a miserable experience. (laughs) It's not the salt one, I promise. (laughs) Dean is napping in the back row, as is his what? Oi. Oi, Dean. What? Is it time to detonate this bomb I'm wearing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, I'm running straight into the middle and my pronouns are he and him. Hello. <laughs> Soon to be was and were. Precisely. <laughs> Soon to be gas expansion. <laughs> So in this episode, we're continuing our discussion on inflation and things related to inflation and how inflation interacts with wages for workers. Specifically, this is a continuation from the Consumer Price Index episode and episode three, where we talked about the relationship between wages and inflation at the worker level. This time, we're going to be looking at wages at the population level. They're getting really Marxist with it to look at the way that wages, other costs and profit interact and who gets what in the share of the productivity and the amount of money that's coming into economy. I love you, but I'm glad I'm wearing a bomb because I'm going to be honest, I don't have no idea how you're going to make this fun to listen to. (laughs) (laughs) It's not meant to be fun, it's meant to be educational. Oh no. Uh uh (laughs) You volunteered, remember. (laughs) So we are going to be talking about the Wage Price Index, or WPI, which like the Consumer Price Index, the CPI, is built to reflect a general movement of cost costs or salaries, if you will, across the whole population. Like the CPI, it doesn't reflect everyone. So we're going to talk a bit about the methodology in a second, but overall, I'm just going to say there are four, six different actual indexes within the wage price index. They count slightly different things. They may include or exclude bonuses. They may include or exclude penalty rates and overtime. So the least general is called the ordinary hours excluding bonuses. What? I'm just going to follow along here. Sorry, I don't have a quip. That's <laughs> that's okay. We we can workshop something. Okay. I'll, so your ordin- I'll think about it. your ordinary hours is your base rate of pay. So this is without penalty rates. This is not including overtime. This is the base rate of pay that you get cited, and excluding bonuses means there are no bonuses. So right. that's basically what's written there. The most general. By general here, you mean common? No, I mean the most inclusive of information. Right. So the least general excludes your bonuses and excludes overtime and things. So it is, in some respects, the least reflective of what you actually take home and pay. Right, right, right. The most general includes bonuses. Sorry, is called the uh, total hours including bonuses. So the most general is not Suleimani. (laughs) Unfortunately. (laughs) Not anymore. R.I.P. King. (laughs) <laughs> so what this means is total hours includes overtime and uh, including bonuses means that the bonuses are included in the salary, basically. The reason to look at both of these is that the least general is kind of the minimum that somebody is expected to do and to take home. So it's the ordinary hours not including overtime and excluding bonuses means that for whatever reason you don't get a bonus, it, it isn't included in anticipation of something like that. As a statistic, these indices are a percentage change in nominal terms. Oh. I know. Okay. I understand percentage. Yep. I think I understand change. Uh-huh. So I think I'm getting stuck on the nominal terms bit. Yeah, yeah. So this means it is not adjusted for inflation. So if you have, say, a 5% WPI, and a 5 there, increase, it's an increase because it's a positive number here. Then your fifty thousand. Uh, that's not a percentage. That's a dollar. Your fifty thousand at the start of the year goes to uh, fifty-two thousand five hundred. She wrote that down. Don't think she calculated on the spot. <laughs> I did not. I write that down. I can't read your hand, right, but I'm sure it's some of those. He's things. lying. I did in fact calculate on that. The trick is ten percent would be five thousand. So half of ten percent is five percent. Two and a half thousand is half of five thousand. Okay. Yep. Yep, he believes me. All right. So this is nominal because it is the change in the number. This does not take into account any kind of inflation. And that, in fact, brings us to, as we saw um, 
last episode? No, a couple episodes ago. The first rule, which is that if the WPI is less than the CPI, so if the overall increase in wages is smaller than the increase in prices, it's a pay cut across the population. I think it's it really is a blind spot in so much... Well, I wouldn't say a blind spot, a deliberately not discussed thing in so much present media that nobody talks about wages as like your allotted share of societal productivity. Mm, mm. And if you don't talk about it that way, then these that kind of calculation doesn't make sense because you say, no, my money went up. Yeah, well, this is one of the reasons that I'm doing this stuff. So the terminology you will hear is change in nominal terms, which means this, change in real terms, which mean, it means adjusted for inflation. Right. So some media sources will talk about change in real terms. I mean, in Australia, there's been a lot of reporting in the past week or so about the fact that actually, and we're going to get to this, workers are not taking home as much as they used to be. Like, the, the increase in wages is less than the increase in inflation in Australia at the moment. And that has actually got detention because the Reserve Bank of Australia has been slamming the cause misery button as hard as it can for the last year. Mm. And it's not doing what they think it's supposed to do, but they keep slamming it anyway. Yeah. I certainly am feeling miserable. <laughs> yeah. I'm always feeling miserable. That's This has got nothing to do with the RBA. <laughs> well, they're always pressing the button, so I don't know if we can rule the connection out. <laughs> These wage price indices are reported on a quarterly basis, so once every three months, and then you have kind of an annual summary for what you get over a particular year or in the 12 months up to a particular date. Like any statistic, the wage price index has a particular scope and it has a particular interpretation based on the research that goes into it. Could you refresh me on scope? I wasn't here for that episode. That just means what it covers. I'm about okay. to talk about it. Okay, yep. fantastic. Yep. So I'm going to write this one as the methods. We will be looking at the sampling, which is what counts towards the number, and then the data collection, which is how you get that information. So the first thing is sampling which from the perspective of statistics is who do you ask for this information? The basic unit is the employing organization that gets selected from tax office records. So these might be private employers, they might be public employers, but they are employers. And that's a really important point. But importantly, they are not all employers. There are particular exclusions agriculture, or rather uh, companies or organizations that are primarily involved in agriculture. Agribusinesses. Mm, forestry, fishing, private household staff. Why are they excluded? Good question. Oh. Mm. And basically foreign embassies. That what I can kind of say. <laughs> well, they basically have a thing where if your pay is not being set by something based in Australia, mm. then it's not really something under their purview. Within these organisations, a selection of job positions get chosen based on instructions from the ABS. If an employer is chosen to be part of this survey, then a certain number of jobs within certain types and job specifications and things will be chosen from each employing organisation. And the idea is that you ask the same organisation about the same job positions over time. So you can track how each individual job position changes. So the sampling always excludes that, that list there? Yes. Right. Okay, but I'm just thinking about the industries that I've worked in, which are not any of the excluded ones, where somebody's, I suppose that makes sense, somebody's pay in a particular position is negotiated individually. Yeah, yeah, so but that can, still counts. Yeah, fair enough. But, but if that person leaves and they are replaced in their job by someone else, mm -hmm. the position continues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not so much tracking the pay of individual people as it is the pay of a particular position. Well, I'll make a note here that often job positions don't. A ton of industry practices in the bullshit email job world I'm in are that you go in, you get a custom position. So they just have joke names. And then when you go, they're gone. You're there to perform a, a hyper-specific temporary role. Yeah. So one of the things that we are now going to talk about is the exclusions. What job positions don't count here? Okay. The excluded job positions include the Defense Force, so the ADF, uh, non-salary owners and partners and directors, which I'm just going to call execs. I know they're not all execs or whatever. Consider them the capitalists in this. People who are commission only. How many jobs is that legal for? I'm not sure, but it's probably more than I would like. Mm. No joke, I'm pretty sure that um, there's a whole bunch of jobs within real estate agents. Uh, primarily yeah. like selling or sales people in general can be uh, commission only in a lot of spaces. Oh, that kind of commission. I thought you meant like, like fairy artists or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, they would come under the contractors, which are also excluded. <laughs> and subcontractors are included in this as well. 
and uh, what are known as non-maintainable positions, which means anything that isn't expected to last more than six months. If you have one of these hyper-specific jobs and it's to do six months of work, that isn't counted. Oh, no, I have a joke. I'm going back Sorry, back a step. Just insert this earlier into the recording. Uh-huh. Uh, non-maintainable positions, do you mean like a V-sit? Because <laughs> that shit hurts. Yeah, it does. I reckon. I don't reckon you could do a V-sit for six months, so yeah. I can't do a V-sit for 60 seconds. Fuck me. <laughs> and don't edit any of that test. Just uh, leave it exactly in oh, the no, order it came from. Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> All right. Do me dirty, fine. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, you've also got job salaries not set by market, so community development employment th- stuff, for example, which is not set, quote unquote, competitively within the market doesn't count, and anything set by like foreign staff based overseas. So your foreign embassies, they're also kind of excluded from the job positions within organizations. Who's missing here? Farm workers, private domestic workers, contractors and subcontractors, and seasonal and short-term work are all immediately excluded from this. Yeah. These are some of the most precarious people, both in their employment and in their general lives. They are often abused for pay. In fact, I think Australia only last year actually started to get rid of peace wages for farm labor, mm. and they wonder why no one wants to work in farms anymore. My sessional teaching at university would probably not count towards this as well. I don't know, but I get like three, four month contracts to do teaching, casual teaching as as a lecturer or a tutor or something. So they would probably be considered non-maintainable positions, even if I do the same subject every year. Overall, this excludes precarious people as a whole. So just as the CPI is limited in its ability to measure the price changes for the very poorest people, this is limited in its ability to account for precarity in the working conditions of the worst paid. I'm curious, with the ADF, I don't know anybody in the ADF, not well enough to ask them sort of, are they notoriously underpaid? It depends on what your job is, mm. first of all. I, I think guess it's... if you're doing something evil, you get paid too much, and otherwise you get paid too little. <laughs> uh, my cousins are in the military, and I believe the vibe is it's like pretty well paid for a working class job, but it's not like... It's not middle class yeah. collar job, yeah. Yeah, so if you wind up senior in a technical position, you can be on a comfortable six figures. Okay. Right. But, of course, very few people wind up senior in technical positions, right? And your average private in the army is not getting six figures or even close. And I'm guessing anybody who has those sort of skills just immediately tries to get out and go... Well, there is certainly, like, a lot of that because private industry pays better. Yeah, yeah. But also, like, there are some pretty big problems with regards to support available to veterans. Jackie Lambie and I disagree on many things, including race politics, but she is right that veterans get absolutely fucked. The other thing is they do get quite good superannuation and um, grants for, like, purchasing houses and that kind of thing benefits as well. Yeah, they get a lot of support like that, but healthcare, availability of healthcare, particularly for people who are retiring, yeah. is absolute dog shit. It, it can be a very um, physically demanding and physically damaging job, even if you're not actually doing combat stuff. Mm. The other part to talk about this is way that this sample turns over. So the selection of employers, so the uh, employing organizations, is taken annually, but they aim to maintain a high proportion of companies or organizations year to year. So a particular organization, particularly if it's a big one, may be in the survey for five, ten years or something before it gets cycled out. So that would be continuing year to year, but small businesses will often cycle out within a year or two. In terms of collecting the data, the organization basically fills out a survey to report on the pay conditions for roles over time, every three months. So it's not reported by the employee? It is not. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. So do you get a letter saying that the Bureau of Statistics is, needs you to fill out this form? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, they have like online surveys and paper surveys and things, depending on what people want to do. Would they be more likely to not go with like businesses that un- employ less than 50 people or whatever? Yeah, so they have uh, specific details about their sampling of small businesses. What they try to do is get a representative sample of workers and jobs across the population. So basically, you look at the proportion of the population who are employed by small business, and the number and that number of jobs should be represented in your sample employed by small businesses right they have slightly changed their methodology recently so that businesses with like two to four employees aren't selected as often as businesses with five or more Mm -hmm. basically because it winds up being a lot of extra work for those small those very small businesses to do and the results that come out of them 
are not very different or not really different at all to the the results you get from businesses with five or more employees. Yeah, they'd mostly be on award wages, wouldn't they? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it depends on the industry and things. But yeah, there's, there is a lot of that. Mm, okay. Yep. Award if you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a big thing of this, right? Because employers are asked what they pay, workers are not asked what they get paid in this particular statistic. It means that anything under the table is missed. Yeah. Examples of systemic underpayment may just not show up because the employers lie about it. All of these, like, little details of the actual lived experience of being employ an employee are not reflected in this data. And the kind of assumption underlying that is on the whole, across the whole population, there isn't that much underpayment, which is um, kind of bullshit, realistically. <laughs> well, especially in light of everything with the the grocery chains. And oh, yeah, yeah. So like Coles chains, everything like that, that systemically underpaid their employees. Yeah. That you have to lift the lid very far on that to find out no. it's just rife. Yep. And o overtime in particular, unpaid overtime is huge across professional sectors. And like, it's just not acknowledged in any of these kind of, any of this sort of statistical stuff. The ABS does different surveys that target workers. So there's like a household survey that goes out that I can't remember the name of that basically asks people what their earnings are before and after tax or mm. before tax, I think, yeah. and how many hours they work and that sort of thing. So you can get access to some of that information from the other side, but it is not considered a kind of population-wide systemic or systematic statistic that's used to look at reporting on the economy in the same way that this is. The methodological shortcomings are pretty obvious in some respects, but this data was not built for the interests of workers primarily. It was built for the interests of governments and employees. And I can't believe that. Mm, I know, right? This repeated reporting structure as well, this every three months, is one of the reasons that they exclude really short-term stuff. But you could still count stuff that's more than three months, and they don't. I think the logic there is basically that if you have something which is like six months long, it would at most include two, so you don't have a great idea of how that position is changing over an extended period of time. This statistic, once you've collected all this information about like a job position, how much it pays at one point in time, how much it pays at another point in time, you then need to kind of collate that into a statistic that looks at change of wages over time across multiple positions, multiple companies, and that sort of thing. This is a bit like in the consumer price index, you have your dozen different brands of baked bean or whatever, and other tinned vegetables and things, and you want to kind of collate all of those foods and the movement of the prices in foods together into something that's meaningful across the whole population. So we have job types across sectors, and the changes get weighted by how much of the workforce and how much of a particular company's salary costs they represent. So if you're talking about like the change of wages for engineers across a whole bunch of sectors, so you will have engineers in different industries, you will have engineers in the public and private sector, mm -hmm. and all of those will contribute to the change in wages for the engineers. Then you say, okay, engineers represent this proportion of the workforce as a whole. So that change for the engineers contributes to that proportion towards the total change. You lost me, but I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to stick with it. I have, I have a diagram. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So basically you've got your private and your public sector within a particular state. Okay. Industry B, industry C are private sector, industry B, industry C are public sector. Right. So these, these things are compared along these various... Structural lines. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it gets grouped together by state as well, which is important to know. Well, I would say even within a state, Australia's states are fucking big. Geographically, yes. Population, no. Fair enough. Yeah, like Australia is a small country population wise. You don't think there would be interesting things to note about industries that have rural as well as Sydney based? You can get some geographic detail out of this, but it's usually a state summary. Okay. That is then compiled into, an inter into a national summary. So what I mean by this is you get what's called a sample weight for a job. The total sample weight for a job coming out of a particular business. So this would be an engineer employed at a company that is within this survey is the business weight, which represents the proportion of the total workforce employed by that particular business times the job sample weight, which is the proportion of the jobs within that business in that particular role. If I'm looking at engineers, I look at, this would be like the engineer's total sample weight. 
say my business employs 0.01% of the population, and I multiply that by the job sample weight and 10% of the people in this business are engineers. Mm -hmm. That becomes, I'm going to write these as a decimal, so it's going to be 0 0.0001 times 0 0.1. The total sample weight is the product of those, which becomes, there's going to be four zeros, 0 0.00001. If engineers within this company have had a 10% wage increase, mm -hmm. they will contribute that as a 10% increase towards the total wage po uh, price index. Okay, so we're all, now I sort of understand, this is all how we come up with the magic number. This is how we come up with the magic number. Okay, I'm sensing a theme for this podcast. <laughs> magic numbers or, mm -hmm. yeah. And how do we convert this to grams? <laughs> this is done in Imperial, actually. It's one of the, the holdovers from the previous era. Oh, so it's like weed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the basic idea is that you look at this across the whole population so that you can look at a kind of total change in the amount that gets spent in labor. So we've got a whole bunch of people who are excluded. Yes. Which means that while we might say that the, if you add up everyone, it says 100, we, in reality, it's only representing a subset of Australia's workers. What percentage of the actual wage is it actually, if we don't have the data, can we even estimate? I, I have not looked to see if that's available, but because it's hard to track, right? Right. Because so many of the things that are excluded are precarious jobs that don't last very long right. or are never documented. It's hard for the ABS to track that stuff. I don't think that means it shouldn't be done. And certainly there are efforts to estimate things like gross underpayments in, in whatever sector, yeah. but it's not included in this. I noticed that um, there's no data point for usefulness. <laughs> That's because all the, all the executives were just run screaming at the idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, genuinely, like, like we were just talking about how so much discussion doesn't circulate on this stuff, like even GDP is just a representation of moving money around, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's called gross domestic product, but you might not even be producing anything. The name's quite misleading. Yes. So the wage price index might, it might represent, given that we're not talking about you know, farming or anything useful. Well, so manufacturing is included in this, but not farming, so... Yeah, we don't have that much fucking manufacturing. I know. <laughs> and I'd point out, aren't most mining contracts what we'd call non-maintainable positions, given that they work for contracts on... Usually they're a year contracts, though. Yeah, so you have you don't have, like, month-to-month -month contracts if the contract runs... If the contract period is 12 months. Okay, yeah, fair right. enough. So uh, you may have it that a mine contracts out work to a mining contractor and then that mining contractor has employees right. or subcontractors and stuff the subcontracting stuff is more common in like tradies mm -hmm. and things like building and construction where a lot of people are forced to work as sole traders so your boss doesn't have to pay you super for example yeah yeah, yeah. and uber uber loves to not actually have employees yeah no classic okay yeah i just was getting at sort of i I, I guess that's like the point of the show, but I'm starting to see holes in this whole wage price index. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We talked about in, in the CPI episode, we talked about how it is not really able to reflect the way that the cheapest products disappearing mm -hmm. affects the poorest people. Right. In the same way, this is not able to reflect the way that the worst working conditions affect the most precarious people mm -hmm. because that's not what it's for. Right. There should be something for that. That's a completely different argument, but this is in, in particular to talk about what these numbers, how, what these numbers actually represent in relation to the real lived conditions of people in the world, how you can understand them in that context. And then to say, okay, so we have this wage price index. We're going to compare it to a consumer price index to look at whether or not the overall average is keeping up Right, right. and then say, there is a lot of people who are worse off than this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. I, um, for my health, don't watch any news. Good idea. So I don't know, are people talking about the, the CPI and the WPI? And the yeah, yeah. So the latest data release on the wage price index was like a week ago. So all of a sudden people are talking about it a lot more because it turns out, oh gee, the consumer price index is a shitload higher than the wage price index, which means that workers are taking a pay cut in real terms. So One of those blue bars is going down. I'm assuming that's bad. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this. these two charts. The top one is the wage price index. These are taken from the ABS latest release. Uh, this one goes back 10 years, but we really care, care about the last five, let's say. Up here, we have the latest release of December 2022. So the wage price index for the September to December quarter last year was about 0.8%. So that means if you were at 50,000, mm -hmm. oh God, 
going to have to do arithmetic. You are now at uh, 50,400. On the other hand, across the past year, which is this line up here, since December 2021, we have seen about 3.25% a wage price index, which is that point there. So that is comparing December 2022 to December 2021 there. That's the total change in that time period. Mm -hmm. Compare this to the consumer price index. So across the December quarter, we have, well, that's about one, that's one and a half. This looks like 1.9% increase in the December quarter for CPI. And the total CPI over the past 12 months was about 7.8%, if I remember rightly. So the two things we compare here are 0.8% and 1.9%. So we go uh, 0.8 minus 1.9 is 1.1%. So in the past three months, across the people counted in the wage price index, they have had a 1.1% pay cut on the whole, in real terms, in terms of what they can buy with the money that they get. We compare the 3.25% to the 7.8%, and we get 3.2... That's a negative down there. 3.25 minus 7.8 is equal to negative 4.55%. So in the past 12 months, in terms of the, in real terms, in terms of what they can buy on the whole, the workers counted in this have basically a four and a half percent pay cut. It sucks. It does. And um, this is kind of what is making like unions and anybody who actually pays attention to this with respect to, well, what can workers buy now? Shit themselves. Britain choosing to solve this problem by um, <laughs> just making there nothing to buy. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Nobody's buying too expensive turnips anymore. We yeah, solved their problem. This is true. This is true. I mean, this uh, the similar pattern to this is happening all across like Western, li let's call them liberal democracies. The Reserve Bank of Australia is talking about what's called a wage price spiral, though, which means as wages go up, they push up the cost of doing things, which is what they see as a, a kind of threat for inflation is that increasing wages will make stuff more expensive. But we've seen wages aren't really meeting inflation. Mm. So what's going on here? And this is where we get Marxist about it. Oh. Uh, it was going to happen. So let's say I am making linen coats and I have some amount of price for which I sell a linen coat. I, the capitalist in this, am not the one making the linen coats, of course. I pay somebody else to do that. So some proportion of this price is taken up by their wages. This is the labor cost to produce a linen coat. I also have to buy the linen, I have to buy the thread and the machinery and all this sort of stuff that is the kind of manufacturing costs of the material costs. So that is another portion of the price. And then there's the little bit on top just for me, which mm. is the profit. The treat. The surplus <laughs> value created by the workers, according to Marxist theory, that I take for myself because fuck the workers, right? Uh, but um, you had the idea to put cloth on your body to not be cold. Yes, this is true. And um, that idea is worth that much of it. <laughs> you had the idea and then you told someone else to design the thing as well. Uh, let's yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, yeah. But I'm the genius at the heart of all of this because not only did I have the idea to make the linen coat, I had the idea to exploit other people to do it for me. And that is worth any amount. Hard to argue. <laughs> <laughs> what we see from the consumer price index is the price for the consumer, the price at the end point. What we see in the wage price index, taking into account all the caveats about coverage and all that sort of thing, is the wages. So the wage price index comes in here. We have something that I'm going to talk about in a second, not in a huge amount of detail, called the producer price index, which is used, or PPI, which is used as basically a metric to look at the cost of manufacturing within the country. And we'll talk about how that breaks down a little bit. But there is no straightforward profit price index from the ABS. There are estimates that we'll, we'll have a look at them a little bit on profit across different sectors. Well, that's nobody's business. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly like shareholder reports and company reports and things do talk about their profit margins, but you can't just go and look up a number to look at the increase in profit in the same way you can for wages, manufacturing and prices. So we have some information on this, but it's not so easy to get our hands on. 
because the ABS does not treat it the same way. Okay, so hang on. I think I can see where this is going. If the wages are not going up mm -hmm. and the manufacturing hasn't gotten any more expensive, uh -huh. then the price must be going up due to China. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's why it's CPI. It's the China price. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> It's got to be Russia, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> or oh, both. Both. They're both to blame, for sure. Surprise, surprise. A balloon floats across the US and people are worried about inflation. Hmm? Coincidence? <laughs> so let's Nothing look. but, really? <laughs> Fuck you. I think the Chinese should send more aggressive aircrafts than balloons. Yeah, they should put, like, a balloon with an angry face on the side. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Here are some... Uh, results for the producer price index. I'm not going to go into it in great detail. Like the WPI, like the CPI, it is a metric for percentage change in the goods and services during manufacturing from one point in time to the other. Unlike CPI, which is about final price at the consumer end, this is looking at costs within the production process. These both come from manufacturing industry. So output of manufacturing is looking at what does manufacturing output and how does the price at the point of sale on to further industrial processes change? Input to manufacturing is looking at what manufacturers are paying for with regards to the stuff that they use in the process of their manufacturing. So it's broken up so you can see the price for buyers and the price for sellers within a um, production process. In the output of manufacturing, Petroleum refining and petroleum fuel manufacturing has gone up 40% in terms of what they are selling their stuff for in the past uh, 12 months. This, this is annual, this dark blue thing. It's dropped 7% in the last quarter, but that means that on the whole, it's gone up 47% and then dropped, yeah. right? You can see that the cost of petroleum and coal product manufacturing, the input has gone up a bit. Oil and gas extraction stuff has gone up, up a bit. So this is the cost of manufacturing stuff. But as a proportion of the total expenditure across the economy, which we're going to go to a second, this does not add up to be all of inflation. And it's worth knowing that output of manufacturing includes the profit. So if I am selling my refined uh, fuel, I have put an extra 40% of cost on that over the past however long, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's cost me that much more to produce stuff because my profit's included in that. So you're saying we can work backwards from these to kind of work out what the, the profit... No, there's actually other data that the ABS collects. I can't remember what, the, what it's called. It's something like annual accounts report or something that basically looks at this in more detail. And some very generous person, by which I mean hopefully well-paid researcher at the Australian Institute, has done the work for me. Marvellous. Yeah, it's great. And if you are right. the hero Maduro, you should be trying to get as much profit as possible in that shit. You should get, you should be fucking pumping it out for the people of Venezuela. <laughs> yes. So let's return to this. So we have our WPI, we have our producer price index, and we have our CPI. This surplus profit stuff has been very generously worked out for us. And now let's go and have a look at some of those results. This comes from a report from the Australia Institute by Stanford. It came out in January or February, I think. Yeah, it would have been January because their final data was September quarter last year. So what this shows is the quarterly change in nominal factor income. So nominal means the actual number, uh -huh. right? So this is the quarterly change in the actual number not adjusted for inflation. So zero is here. You can see that there was a dip in the percentage of basically the wage price index during the early bit of COVID. And then that was kind of ticking along about 2%-ish across this time period. You can see the massive spike in small and big business profits. So small business is some number of employees that I don't remember. Corporations is like bigger than that and public traded stuff like that. Delivering me burgers. Exactly, yes. You can see that there was a huge spike, then a drop, but the height is bigger than the lowest point. So this yeah, peaks yeah. out at nearly 20%, but the bottom is at 10%. So it went up 20% and then back 10%, which does not take you back down to here. Overall, over this period of this massive spike and then the drop, still represents a net increase in the nominal factor incomes for small business and corporations. Right, which is the profit. 
profit effectively. Yeah. So you can see that this is kind of ticking along over here. There's another bit of a spike for small and then bigger business. Yeah. What you can do is you can look at the cumulative change over time. So you can look at the total ups and downs and Stanford has very generously given us this. So this is the cumulative change in factor incomes as a percentage. Uh -huh. Nominal GDP is like the total amount of money coming in. We will do an episode sometime on GDP and how it's calculated, but you can think of that as this is how much GDP overall has changed. If you are bigger than that, you are getting a greater share of GDP. If you are smaller than that, you are getting a smaller share of GDP. If everything is equal to that, then everyone's getting an equal share in the growth. Right. Would you believe labor compensation is here? That is below nominal mm. GDP. Mm. Corporate profit and small business returns are here. These are above the nominal GDP increase. Yeah. So that tells us that company profit is getting a bigger share, which means that labor is losing out and the manufacturing costs are not contributing as much to the change as would be represented if you just look at the CPI. Might we instead reframe this that labor are short kings? <laughs> um, I would like to point out that it would not be an even share if everything was equal to GDP because you would still be you would still it's be a proportional a share. A proportional is share is what I mean. Like yeah, a, yeah. Um, so the actual amount I mean, I, I personally believe that labor is entitled to all that it creates, which means that all of this is theft. But if everything is growing proportionally, then theoretically, if you assume that profit is not theft, it's quote unquote fair. And here is that change in the share of GDP. Oh, never good where it goes down. <laughs> never good where it goes down. So this is looking at labor, profits, tax, and these things have some proportional of the share of the GDP that's flowing around. Some amount of that money is going to all these different sources. And you can look at the proportional change in that. So what this chart tells us, thanks again to Stanford, is that corporate profit has been 3.2% increase in their share of GDP. Labor has lost 2.2% of their share of GDP. So what this means is that corporate profits are taking more of the money than they were previously, and labor is losing out. Which indicates that if the price is going up, it's not the fault of wages. It is not the fault of wages. Which might suggest, hang on, are you, are you telling me that the Reserve Bank of Australia has like a, an alignment to a particular class interest? <laughs> I will not be accepting this slander of our fine institution. <laughs> I might just be suggesting that. Okay. But what this means is basically that these efforts to discipline labour, these efforts to tell workers that they are demanding too much because they are fueling inflation are for one, pure ideology, and also like actively a lie. What tends to happen in these circumstances, and we can track it, is that the consumer price index goes up, things cost more, employees go, I can't afford my rent, I need more money, give me more money. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, across you know, the whole uh, economy these things happen. Workers are able to make some demand for an increase in wages. It may not be as much as inflation, hopefully it is, but you know, worker power and all that sort of thing. And then what the Reserve Bank does, it goes, oh my god, these people working in cafes are suddenly able to demand $40 an hour because nobody wants to work in cafes after COVID, or they all got secure jobs and all these sorts of things. Workers just have too much power, and then they start hammering, which is the uh, cash rate, which makes borrowing more expensive, which makes your mortgage or your landlord's mortgage more expensive, which tightens the screws on what workers can afford because suddenly more money is going out of their pockets to pay for all of this stuff. Whereas where that inflation is actually coming from is not labor and it's not materials, it is corporate profits. So another thing that this report actually did was basically hypothesize about a world in which there was not this additional profit taking by corporations and small business and ask what would the inflation rate be if that didn't happen because you can have you have data there you can make that hypothesis right. it doesn't necessarily just include australian corporations because stuff being imported to australia for manufacturing pays profit overseas right for where it was, it was bought from but you can do this calculation and the actual estimate was uh, that if you did not have this additional profit taking, inflation would be about 2.7% over the last year. Not 
7.8% over the last year. Am I setting off this bomb vest or am I not? <laughs> what, are we, what are we saying? I mean, do you want to go to paradise or not? <laughs> Set off half the bomb vest and I have a couple of corporate offices we should go to next. That's true. The other, the thing that it's worth pointing out with the hitting the uh, fucking cash rate button is that they are deliberately trying to trigger a recession. That is ultimately the goal. They need a higher unemployment rate if they're going to take away workers' leverage and the way to do that is to trigger a recession. Yes, and uh, it, it certainly appears to be working at the moment. There's fundamentally no political project outside of the a bomb vest or something in that area that has any like. There's no electoral route to no but to the, avert this. Is so what's actually happened here, and this has happened across countries, so you can see this in the UK and the US and things like that, is that governments have abandoned their role as kind of economic policy groups mm. for ideological reasons mostly, but also because they don't want to be called socialist and basically handed off responsibility for economies to monetary policy, which is what the Reserve Bank does. And the Reserve Bank is going, I only have this one lever to pull. Oh, fuck, I love pulling this one lever. So I'm going to keep ratcheting it as hard as I possibly can under the pretense that it will put a cap on inflation. It's clearly not. Uh, they desperately hope it will, but they're going to keep pulling that lever anyway. When what we really need is a government that says, no, we need to actually address people's living conditions. Do you think any of them are aware of this? Like po uh, politicians or? Politicians, government officials. I think that more or less explicitly, I think some of them are certainly aware of it. It's just where they think their class interests lie. I'm willing to bet that a fair number of people in the Liberal Party are excruciatingly aware of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But they are on the punish the workers, discipline the workers side of things. I think some better Labour people will be aware of it, but I think they are too spineless or too unable to change the direction that the party has been marching slow, steadily rightward for the last 40 years. Well, also, like, the last time that there was someone willing to challenge that, there was a whole conspiracy with, like, the Queen and fucking... And the CIA, and the to, CIA, get CIA to get him yes. to pose. Like, it's... <laughs> yeah. I mean, Gough Whitlam wasn't even necessarily that socialist in his own right, but he was being dragged leftwards by a powerful unions and powerful left-wing group of the Labour Party. If only we could see that now. <laughs> well, if there's no political recourse within the Labour Party, because where the fuck would there be? I'm always getting emails from my union about various different issues. My union isn't talking about this. Is there any industrial effort to... So there are sure? there are more radical unions than the one you're in, let's yeah, say, for, to, <laughs> to start with. But this particular report, so the Stanford 2023 report, is now getting a lot of traction because... It is the first kind of flag that has gone up to say, here is the data, here is the reality of where this profit is, where this change in CPI is actually going. It is at the very least countering the narrative of a wage price spiral. Yeah. Or as the uh, apparently the Reserve Bank did consider calling it a price wage spiral to at least indicate that they were aware that wages tend to follow prices and not the other way around. Not that that would change them slamming the misery button, of course, but, you know, aesthetics, right? So, listener, your duty is to show this podcast to five people or inflation will continue to go up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also point out that the unions signed a suicide pact in the, pact in the 1990s called the Accord, which... yes. So unions have limitations on what they can do. Yeah, yeah no, I'm aware. Look, all I'm saying is that the Australian Unemployed Workers Union and the Retail and Fast Food Workers Union did not sign that accord. Yeah. Mm. What are their membership levels, though? This is <laughs> <laughs> AUWU is actually growing really fast. Shout out to them. Please go back and watch our episodes with the AUWU and with Asha Wolf as well, where we talk about unemployment stuff and the current unemployment welfare system in Australia. Anyway, that is everything for today. Bart, Dean, thank you so much. Thank you. No, you, you're welcome. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't on fire. This I prepared a bunch of material for doing an episode on inflation. <laughs> I looked this up online and I've got a very different opinion uh, on what this was going to be about. Well, the economy becoming big and round. The economy becoming big and round. Yes, okay, this is about the economy about. becoming big and round. Dear listener, we have a Patreon that I keep forgetting to advertise at the start of these shows. You can get bonus episodes once a month. The next bonus episode will hopefully be recorded and published before the end of the month. In fact, the end of the month is tomorrow, so that will not be happening. So you'll get two bonus episodes in March instead. 
Uh, that is patreon.com slash statisticallyinsignificant, and I'll see you two later. See you then.